Beautiful. Thank you. Well, I'm delighted to, to welcome you all here um, this afternoon. It is both my honor and my pleasure to introduce our speaker this afternoon. But um, if he doesn't mind too much, I want also to share very good news. We heard just this morning about Barbara Ransby, whose most recent book has been awarded. Um, the Letitia Woods Brown Book Award. So I just had to, I just had to say that, sorry. <laughs> and I didn't want to steal Harry Sunday, but we won't do that. Anyway, now turning to the, the event at hand. Um, Tony Bogues, who we're delighted to welcome, is Lynn Cross Professor of Social Sciences and Critical Theory and Director of the Center for the Study of Slavery and Justice at Brown University. He is no stranger to UIC, having visited several times last year at the invitation of the Social Justice Initiative. And these announcements would always catch my eye, and you know, as chance would have it, I would be teaching off campus at the Newberry. But finally, in May when he came, I was able to attend one of the lectures, and I was just very, very captivated by what he had to say and how he had to say it. So I'm delighted that he was re willing to return once again to UIC for another visit, this time hosted by the Department of History with the co-sponsorship from Departments of African American Studies and Philosophy, the Social Justice Initiative, and of course the Institute for the Humanities. Much of Professor Bogue's work can be described as intellectual history. His first two books were Caliban's Freedom, The Early Political Thought of C.L.R. James, and Black Heretics and Black Prophets, Radical Political Intellectuals. His more recent Empire of Liberty, Power, Freedom, and Desire, is part of a series entitled Remapping the Transnational, and has been described as a thoughtful and timely consideration of the nature of American power and empire 
in which he argues that America's self-presentation as the bastion of liberty is an attempt to force upon the world a single universal truth which has the objective of eradicating the radical imagination. This work grapples with issues of power, race, slavery, and violence, as well as the nature of post-colonial criticism and critical theory. Professor Bogues is clearly adept with culture theory, but he's more, much more than a cultural critic. Rather, he's interested in finding and articulating a way ahead. The pursuit of this path forward, if you will, is at the heart of his current book project. Um, this is entitled, And What About the Human? Wither Human Emancipation and Human Freedom. And this book is grounded very much in questions of human freedom historically, but also in our present. While Tony Bowes can be certainly described as an intellectual historian, the questions he is interested in have led him deeply into interdisciplinary territory as well. He describes himself as focusing on questions rather than any specific disciplinary field of study. And one of the questions I understand him to be grappling with is how can historians, particularly historians working in colonial contexts, access archives beyond those created in the colonial context by the colonizers? Uh, because those archives inevitably reproduce, of course, the relations of power encoded in that colonial experience. And this question has led him recently in several new directions, um, including both art on the one hand and oral history on the other. Um, he has recently co-curated a national exhibition of Haitian art called Reframing Haiti, Art, History, and per Performativity. And he's also working on a new project conducting oral histories with aging militants in South Africa as well as South African literary figures. I learned this morning also that he's engaged in a project involving numerous scholars entitled Thinking Africa Differently, which aims to produce a new and different history of decolonization. But the title of his talk today is the Black Jacobins and the Long Haitian Revolution, Archives, Historiography, and the Writing of Revolution. Please give a warm welcome to Professor Tony Bogues. Thank you very much, uh, Laura. Um, I want to begin with a word of apologies. I have a bad flu. And if I cough, um, my apologies um, before. Right? Um, I have tried to <clears throat> take a couple of cough drops, uh, courtesy of uh, your faculty members. So <laughs> my hope is that it will work for the next hour or so. I want to begin by <laughs> thanking the various departments for organizing this talk, departments of history, <coughs> philosophy, African-American studies, uh, the Social Justice Initiative, and the Humanities Institute. Over the past months, past several months, the University of Illinois Chicago has become an important space for me to think aloud, to engage in critical conversations. So I want to thank the various departments for making it possible again, and I hope that we will have an engaged conversation. Let me outline what I will attempt to do this afternoon. Firstly, I want to offer a reading of the writing of Black Jacobins by C.L.R. James. Not a reading of the text itself, but its historical writing and the conditions for the writing of that text. Secondly, in doing this, I confront a central question of historical writing and historiography, the writing of revolution. And I think about the writing of revolution in really trying to think through questions about history and historical knowledge and the notion of temporality. Thirdly, I want to make a shift from thinking about these questions to thinking about the Haitian revolution itself 
and the questions of archives. I should state that my preoccupation with history, with notions of temporality, really is deeply, connect, are deeply connected to the time we live in. What Walter Benjamin would call in his an addendum in the concept of history, and here I quote him, the ways in which the constellation of one's own epoch comes into contact with that of another earlier one, establishing what he says is a concept of the present as that of here and now, end of quote. This here and now is marked both by the defeat, or if you wish, the rollback, of ideas about the general possibilities of human freedom and human emancipation, and is also marked by a desire, I would argue, of power to create forms of human life, which negates the human as a life form on our planet where change is possible. Yet, in the midst of all this rollback, in the midst of this so-called failed history or history as stalled, there are what I like to call flashes of possibility. And that in these flashes of possibility, to come back again to Walter Benjamin, there is the necessity for grappling with what Benjamin calls the epochs, our epochs in his contact with an earlier one. Thus, my preoccupation with the writing of what of Black Jacobins is not so much about the text as it is written in a romantic mode of 19th century European historical writings, and therefore shaped by the horizons of the French Revolution. And then to ask the question, as some have asked, what about tragedy? A question which, in my mind, returns us to a certain kind of Greek historical writing where Ulysses listens to the story of his life. Ulysses, at times we know, listening to the story of his life has been paradynamic and, and the way in which we think about questions of tragedy. It is the way in which, to quote Anna Horent, we want to have, we want to save human deeds, Anna Horent says, from futility that comes from obliv oblivion. And Anna Horent has a thing about the ways in which actions that we have because they are so finite and things turn into oblivion that we want to save it and therefore this is part of tragedy and part of a certain notion of history. In this perspective that Harent puts forward that Ulysses develops and that a lot of people today in thinking about writing about revolution think because they say we're in a tragic moment, that in this particular perspective history becomes a necessity through what Harent again working through Hegel calls, and here I quote her, the tears of remembrance. Rather than working through this tears of remembrance and tragedy, I want to talk about the Black Jacobins as a writing about revolutionary possibilities. I remind you that here of the end of the book itself, pages 375. And this is what C.L.R. James says. Finally, those black laborers, black Haitian laborers and mulattoes have given us an example to study. Despite the temporary reaction of fascism, the prevailing standards of human liberty, James says, and equality are infinitely more advanced and more profound than those in 1789. Judge relatively by these standards, the millions of blacks in Africa and the few of them who are educated as such are pariahs in that vast prison as the blacks and mulattoes of Saint Damar. James continues, the blacks of Africa are more advanced, nearer ready than the slaves of Saint Damar. This is the, and then he quotes a particular appeal written by somebody. My point here, therefore, is to begin to understand the black Jacobins as a book that is written about the possibilities of revolution rather than a book about tragedy. Written in 1938, no one thought except a few hard souls that decolonization was possible in Africa. And so it is there I want to begin. What are the elements and what were the elements that made the writing of the Black Jacobin possible? Its conditions of possibilities, therefore, for its writing. It is 1936. A group of West Indians and, Af and Africans have come together to form an organization called 
the International African Service Bureau. In its group are the following, C.L.R. James, George Padmore, a Trinidadian who was the leading commentary official of the uh, leading official of the commentary, who left the commentary and came back to London, Amy Ashwood Garvey, the first wife of Marcus Garvey, and Jomo Kenyatta, who became the first president of Kenya, and a fellow by the name who we don't know enough about called Ras McConnell. And McConnell was very important because McConnell found money all the time for all for them to meet and always could feed them when they were when they were hungry. Two things galvanized this group of men and one woman into forming the International African Service Bureau. The first was the Italian invasion of Ethiopia, first in October in 1935 and then in May 1936. And secondly was the emergence of what Padmore would later call the, uh, the, the emergence of colonial fascism. If the International Service Bureau published a journal called International African Opinion, edited by James, what was more important for this organization was an extraordinary writing program, which they themselves established. And I find that very fascinating, a group of people involved in political activity established not just a newspaper, but a writing program. In this writing program, the black Jacobins would emerge as one of the texts. But so too with George Padmore's How Britain Rules Africa, Africa and World Peace. Eric Williams, who becomes the Prime Minister of Trinidad and Tobago in this amazing book called The Negro in the Caribbean, a book called The Native Problem in South Africa that does not have a name and we're not quite sure who, who wrote it, and Kenyatta's study of the Kikui ethnic group called Facing Mount Kenya. Also published in this cluster of amazing publication in 1936 is something, a book called The History of Negro Revolt. And Negro Revolt, was, this book was written by, by James, but James, in a series of letters which have not yet been published, argues that it is himself and Padmore who wrote the book and how they had fun together at night trying to write this particular book. What is the politics of this group? And why are they following this explicit writing program? For this group, writing was part of political practice, not just publishing a newspaper, but writing as criticism and as critical intervention was an essential mode of its political praxis and was seen just as important as the organizing political work that they were engaged in. The group's political politics was largely around the support of democratic rights and self-determination for colonies with a very sharp focus on Africa. James notes in his semi-autobiography, Beyond the Boundary, about the black Jacobin, that he says the book was written not with the Caribbean in mind, but with Africa in mind. What is my point here? It is that the conditions for the possibilities of the writing of the black, Jac 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 black Jacobins emerges out of an explicit political context and as an act of explicit political activism by a group of people. Secondly, that it emerges in a moment in which there are struggles for, the, for political independence and that struggle is seen as something that is distant and will not necessarily happen. But it is also very importantly part of a collective group of work. In other words, here are a group of men and women who collectively sit down and decide this is what we are going to do and this is our writing program. And therefore, the text I want to argue is about historical revolution but it is about historical revolution as political and future possibility. It is therefore a text in which there is a juxtaposition of temporalities, a past which is exemplar, the Haitian Revolution, and a future which is possible, African independence. It means that those of us who think that history has ended or stalled and understand that the black Jacobin is tragic, that we may not therefore understand that history is always open, and history, I put here in quotation marks, is all, always open. And if we understand history as always open, then we may begin to understand the black Jacobins as a marker of historical time. So let us turn to this writing of the black Jacobins. James makes it clear in a series of lectures in 1971 at the, at the Institute of Black World in Atlanta, and the, the lectures are as follows. 
how I wrote the Black Jacobins. Black Jack second lecture, Black Jacobins and Black Reconstruction. And the third lecture, how I would rewrite the Black Jacobins. <laughs> <coughs> this is what CLR says in the first lecture. He says, and how I wrote the Black Jacobins. He says that I was driven, besides then talking about the International African Service Bureau, he makes the point that he says, <coughs> I had made up my mind, other than what Padmore and so on and the group had wanted, for no more than a literary reason that I would write the Black Jacobins. And so I suckled down when I came to England to import as much material as I could from France so I could begin to write this text. James also makes a point in the lectures that he was very immersed at that point in his life, 1934, 35, 36, in reading the three volumes of Trotsky's History of the Russian Revolution. And that is this his reading of preparing, in preparing to write the Black Jacobins, he also spent a great deal of time reading Jules Michelet's History of the French Revolution. So I want us to begin to think about the conditions of writing. What it is that goes into the writing of the text? The political context that I have talked about. What is it that this group of men and one, one woman is trying to do? Then James's own reading and research, and then his own influence. Trotsky's three volumes of the history of the revolution, and <clears throat> Michelet's history of the French Revolution. But what is and James's then literary, lit, literary ambition? But what I think is interesting to understand, therefore, is that beside the literary ambition, there are two other influences then: French revolutionary historiography and Marxist historiography, particularly as I said the history of the Russian Revolution by Trotsky. It is perhaps important to pause here to see what Michelet, Julius Michelet, says in his own preface of the history of the French Revolution, published in English in 1902. And this is what he says, Michelet. It possesses a knowledge, and here's writing about the French Revolution. It possesses a knowledge of which others are ignorant, Michelet says, when in a moment of weakness we may appear, and he's writing for the French, forgetful of our own experience, it is at this point that we should go to, that is go back to the French Revolution, and that we should re recur and try to recover ourselves again and again. The revolution, Michelet says, lives in ourselves. I think this is an important quote, because if you read Black Jacobins, you will begin to see that James is also thinking about a certain way in which the Haitian Revolution cuts across all temporalities. That is that the Haitian Revolution is not just a revolution of the 1700s, but also is a revolution that has resonates and echoes, if you wish, later on in history. Trotsky himself, in writing the history of the Russian Revolution, makes the point in the preface, he says. The history of a revolution, Trotsky says, is like every <coughs> other history. We ought to, and, and therefore it means, first of all, we ought to tell what happened and how. Fairly conventional, I would argue. Events, Trotsky says, can neither be regarded as a string of adventures nor strung together in a thread of preconceived moral argument. Trotsky continues, they must obey their own laws. And then he makes what I think is the critical point. For him, the discovery of these laws is the task <laughs> of the historian and author. So I think you want to, to think about that. This book, which is very influential in James' life, person who writes it says the role of the historian is to discuss and to find out and find laws. And the second, Michel is arguing <coughs> that this thing, revolution, has a certain kind of a temporality to it, that it echoes, it resonates. Um, throughout certain times. What is interesting, I find, in thinking about these two prefaces is to think about James's first preface to the Black Jacobins, and as you know, the Jacobins has been published many times. And this is what James says. The revolt, thinking about the Haitian Revolution, is the only successful slave revolt in history. The transformation of slaves trampling in hundreds before a single white man into a people able to organize themselves and defeat the most powerful European armed nations of their, day, of, the, of their day, is one of the great epics of revolutionary struggle and achievement. Why and how this happened is the theme of the book. So you would say to yourself, okay, so he's like Trotsky. He's then saying, okay, I'm going to tell the story in the way 
it is supposed to, to who is supposed to be told. So my argument here then is very simply that it superficially it would seem that James is working in a tradition. And the tradition is really a certain kind of revolutionary historiography, both from the French and then the Marxists, Alatraski, about how to write about revolution. And the question that, he's, that he faces is how is the story of the Haitian revolution to be written? And rather, the way I would like to put it, how can it be written? But before I come to that point about how can the Haitian revolution be written, it is important, it's important I think, to say something that we have often elided in discussions about black Jacobins. It is this. <clears throat> I want to suggest to you that 20th century intellectual history needs to pay attention to the various African diasporic networks of the 1920s and 1930s and the work that they have produced. And I remind you of some of that work. 1938, Amy Césaire, Notebook of Return to My Native Land, published in Paris. 1935, Black Reconstruction by W.B. Du Bois. And then there's Black Jacobins, 1938. These are three central texts today of literature and history, all produced within a three-year time frame. All these folks are not yet in touch with each other. They would be in touch with each other later on. But I want to argue for a rethinking of intellectual history by thinking about Africa and the Caribbean and a certain kind of and the diaspora in New York, in Paris, in London, and particularly <coughs> the nodal moment of the 1956 Paris Conference of the Black Writers and Artists. But let us return to Black Jacobins and his geography, and in doing so, pay specific attention to the first preface and James speaking about Toussaint Louverture. James identifies Toussaint Louverture as one of the most important figures of the 1700s and 1800s, comparable, he says, only to Napoleon. But this is what he says about Toussaint. <coughs> <coughs> Yet it was the revolution, CLR says, that made Toussaint. And even that, CLR says, I'm quoting him, is not the whole truth. So James is doing something that is very important in this preface. He said, the revolution made, Toussaint made a revolution, yet it is a revolution that made Toussaint, but yet that is not the whole truth. So he's posing a very fundamental question here about agency and structure. And what is the relationship between people making history and the structures and the conditions under which they make history? Therefore, posing a question about human action and circumstances. James continues, great men in this preface, great men make history but only such history as it is possible for them to make. And you say, ah, oh, that sounds like Marx, social being determined consciousness. Huh? Their freedom of achievement, James says, is limited by the necessities of their environment. And then he goes on to say the following. To portray the limits of necessity and the realization complete or partial of all possibilities, that is the true business of a historian. Now, think about what Trotsky said. The historian is to discover what? The laws. James says the question is understanding, if you wish, the questions of human possibility within, within defined circumstances. I want to suggest that James's conceptions of history, therefore, becomes different from Trotsky, which is not about laws of development. I rather that I would suggest that in James there is a play in James's conception. There is both necessity and play. And it is in the interstices between necessity and play, and therefore of human action, that for James, Toussaint made a revolution, but the revolution also made Toussaint. James then posits a conception of writing about history and the revolution, which I think is extremely important. And this is all in the preface, almost four pages of a preface. And this is what he says, <coughs> sorry, three pages of, of a preface. He says, in the, in the revolution, when the ceaseless, slow accumulation of centuries burst into volcanic eruption, the meteorotic flames and flags above are meaningless chaos and lend themselves to infinite caprice and romanticism, unless the observer sees them as projections of the subsoil from, from below. And then he talks about the writers to analyze and demonstrate economic forces, but also the molding of society and politics, of men and individual men and mass of men. 
And then he does something which is, is remarkable. He says, the, an the analysis of this is the science and the, and the demonstration of this art is the history. So he actually makes a particular distinction between a certain scientific understanding of social forces in a particular place, or social scientific as we would call it, and the, the writing of it, which he argues is the art of it. And then he says something else which I think is really very important. Tranquility is, neither, is either innate for the Philistine or to be acquired only by deliberately doping of personalities. He says this book was written when we could hear the booming of Franco's heavy artillery, the rattle of Stalin's firing squads, and the fierce shrill turmoil of the revolutionary movement striving for clarity and influence. Such is our age, James says, and this book is of it, and something of the fever on the fret of it. <clears throat> so it would seem to me that to think about black Jacobins is to think about this business of the fever and the fret of the times, and how the fever and the fret of the times, if you wish, creates a certain conditions of possibilities for thinking and writing about revolution. It is this fever and fret and its relationship to history and time that I now want to turn to. What is the difficulty that the intellectual historian and the political philosopher face in trying to think through questions of the Haitian Revolution and the writing of history? Because I would argue that James was both an intellectual historian and political philosopher and political theorist and not in any reductive manner. But what is the difficulty, therefore, that one faces when confronted with these particular questions? We might begin to think about some of these difficulties by thinking about revolution itself. It is, of course, a moment of rupture. But I would want to suggest to you that revolution is about a moment of rupture in what I would like to call a historical flow of time. And this is, I want to spend a minute here by trying to parse out what I mean. I want to understand and to suggest to you that there is a way in which we need to think about history as distinct from historical knowledge, which is what we write about history. History, which is something we think about as something in the past, but rather to try and think about history as a way in which human beings engage with time. And it is that engagement with time that actually creates history and that we then want to write about. And that revolution, if you wish, is about a rupture of that kind of quotidian engagement with time or in, in, a, in, 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 in an everyday sense. To return to Benjamin for a moment, in making a distinction with what Benjamin makes in, in, in his book on concept of history, making a distinction between historicism and a radical moment in history, Benjamin talks about the exploding of the continuum of history. The revolution, Benjamin says, and here I quote him, as leap into the open sky of history. <clears throat> as such, I would argue that the revolution is an event. I'm going to put this in italics, please. Anna Horent makes a point in her book on revolution that revolution, she says, beginning with the French Revolution, is really a moment in which the idea of freedom and a new beginning, Anna Horent says, coincide. Revolution as this new beginning. Let's stay with that for a while. Let's tarry with it. Let us think about the new beginning as an event. And here, I'm not thinking about the way in which Alain Badu thinks about the questions of event in being an event as one question of discernibility. But rather, I'm thinking about an event as a critical moment, one of rupture, in which what I like to call epiphanies, working from James Joyce's book, novel, in which epiphanies emerge within, within the specific moment. These epiphanies, I argue, means that there is a chance for a new way of thinking, because in these epiphanies, new questions emerge. It, in these ruptures event, there, is no, there are no fixed predicates, because we are, to quote Paul Ricoeur, in a flux of history. <clears throat> now, political and philosophical thinking about the events from Althusser to Deleuze to Derrida take as point of their departure 
and thinking about their thinking about event. Marx's remarkable work, Eighteen Brumaire of Louis Bonaparte. The Lose in particular develops the idea of time out of joint, working through Shakespeare's Hamlet. Derrida would later take up this point about time out of joint to begin to think about the spectral and the ghostly, which emerges out of the time out of joint. What to me is interesting is that both of these philosophers, in thinking about questions of event and time out of joint, and working through Marx, really are working through a failed revolution. One which was a turning point, but a turning point which closes rather than one that opens. So therefore, what it is when we, when we have a revolution that opens rather than close? What happens, I think, is that when you have a revolution that's closed, and working through Marx's A.T. Brumaire, is that the question of repetition emerges. So issues of the past as repetition emerges, where re repetition becomes a historical condition. But just to think about it, Marx himself in the 18th Brumaire notes that people identify themselves with figures of the past. And here I quote, you know, in, in quotation marks. What I would submit is that this event, which I'm talking about as revolution, <coughs> is a complex compression of time. We who act in these events actually leak, hark back to a past. But while we hark back to a past, we also try to reach for a future. Both happen simultaneously. They are not distinct. But they are distinct, but they are also related. And, they are, they are, and because history, if you wish, is what I'm calling our engagement with time, then epiphanies all sometimes appears in the, disguises, in the guises of the old while address, attempting to address the new. The moment of rupture, therefore, is never an absolute one. It is always about working through to get to another side. It is within this complex of the event and its relationship to temporality where the new emerges always embracing the whole, but trying to free itself from that embrace that I now want to turn to the long Haitian revolution. I begin this section with two citations which frame what I will say. The first is from an ex-slave, now a revolutionary slave, that is a sex slave who has become a revolutionary slave. And the situation is one in which he is fighting with the Spanish against the French. And those of you who know the course of the revolution in saint Domingue, which then becomes Haiti, will know that the, the slaves first joined the British, then they joined the French, and they tried to play the politics against colonial empires and so on. And this particular slave was promised by the Spanish that, <coughs> that he would be free. Now, however, the French Revolutionary Assembly, 1794, has passed a law abolishing slavery. And he's been asked by the French, com 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 French commanders in saint Domingue to join, lead the Spanish, and join them. His name is Makaya. And this is what he says to them, the French commissars, in 1793. And I just love this. He says, I am the subject of three kings. The king of Congo, who is the master of all the blacks. Of the king of France, who represents my father. Of the king of Spain, who represents my mother. These three kings are the descendants of those who, led by a star, came to adore God, made man. And I hope when I've read this, and I've read this often, I thought to myself, no, if I was a French colonial commander, what in the earth could I make of this? <laughs> right? Of this rebel leader, portent rebel leader, who I'm saying to him, please join us, we will not, our assembly has freed slaves. And he looks at me and tells me, tells me this thing about, I am the subject of three kings. Obviously, there is a Christian story that is being played out here, the three kings and the following of the star and so on. But to me, the most important <clears throat> thing is that I am the subject of the king of Congo, who is the master of all blacks. What that means is that I am not trusting you. And I am not, you can free whoever you want to free. But I am not going to join you because, uh, on, because my, what the, my king, who I mentioned first, who is the master of all blacks, would not want me to join you. And I think that that becomes a very important thing because you begin, begin to see that there's another set of ideas, set of political ideas, that are operating within this Haitian revolution. <clears throat> 
And so I ask myself, what can we make of this today? My other citation is from the colonial archive itself. And it comes from a colonial official who comes to Saint-Domingue before it is independent in 1804. And he writes back to the French colonial office. These blacks, and here I quote him, have their own conception of freedom. I, had, so I want to those, juxtapose those two citations together. One of a man who's fighting an ex-slave who's a revolutionary slave who says, I'm the subject of three kings. And the other one, and, and, and the colonial archive uh, official, uh, colonial fish official from the archive, who says <clears throat> these blacks have their own conceptions of freedom. And so I begin this final segment this way, because I want to point out to two issues, the issues of archive and how archives fundamentally shapes our historical writing. James, in the third lecture of, at the Institute of the Black World in 1971, and how I would write the Black Jacobins, makes this particular point. He doesn't do it about archive, but he's asked, how would he rewrite it, the Black Jacobins? And this is what he says, which I think is important. He says that <coughs> I, he quotes a description of the slaves from the colonial, French colonial archive. And then he says, I don't want today to be writing and say that that's what they said about us and how we were treated. No, not any longer, no. I would want to say what we had to say, meaning the slaves, about how we were treated. He then goes on. We have had enough of what they have said about us, even when they are sympathetic. It is time we begin to say what we think about ourselves and the historical development of our past should be, should be said by what people had to say about themselves in those days. The evidence, James says, is there. It raises, obviously, the question of the archive. Now, there are those of us who argue that one has to work against what, again, what Walter Benjamin would call working against the grain, and that we would go into the colonial archive and we work against the grain. That is, we take what is there and we try to turn it around, and we say, this is what it, you know, this is what they said, this is what I, we think they, they mean. But the more fundamental issue I would want to suggest <clears throat> is how to get to the voices, to the evidence, of the subalterns, if you wish, about themselves. And here, in the Haitian Revolution, there are two problems. The first problem identified by Michel Trullio, the late Michel Trullio, really remarkable Haitian historian and anthropologist who taught at University of Chicago and died died about a year ago. And Julio makes the point in this book about history that the Haitian Revolution, he says, works itself out in practice. And therefore, the question of practices becomes important as part of an archive. And secondly, he says that there's not much formal written stuff. I tend to disagree with him. There's a lot of formal written stuff. We just have to know where to look. But that's, an, that's, an, that's another matter. So, but I want to focus on how to get to these practices. And here the matters even becomes even more complicated because the subaltern practice of the, of the Haitian people, the Haitian slaves or the Haitian ex-slaves, was around voodoo. And therefore, it is here in my view that the history of the revolution and all its complexities can be told. Colin Dion, a remarkable Haitian literary scholar, in a book, really a remarkable book called Haiti History and Gods, makes the point that voodoo, she says, is a system of thought. I want to agree with her on that. But I want to also su suggest that it is a, both a system of thought, but also a system of self-fashioning of self. And that the self-fashioning of self is about a set of counter-symbolic practices. And it is how we begin to think about these counter-symbolic practices that, in my view, forces us to begin to think about what a new archive would look like. And if I could just get help, I just want to show, show three, um, three things here um, as to show you what I, what I mean. <clears throat> I want to take three particular paintings. This first painting is by a man called Andre Peer. And what Andre Peer, Haitian artist, attempts to do is that he attempts to paint 
what he understands to be the 200 laws or gods or spirits, whichever phrase you want to use, of the Haitian voodoo religion. This is my particular favorite painting. But what is interest of, of his, he has other really magnificent pieces. But this, look at the, what he says, look what this painting says. It says, Gideon spirits returning to Africa after the Haitian Independence War. Now, if you think about that, then what do you, and you have to think about the War of Independence in Haiti and the Haitian Revolution. <clears throat> you immediately have to think that in oral history and in memory, and in voodoo religion, there is a way in which the story of the Haitian Revolution is actually told. And it is told with these spirits. And you might say, okay, <coughs> you, what you're talking about really, you know, is you, you, you kind of uh, just, you know, you, you, you're being mythical. But what is one of the most important scenes in the history of Haitian art? This. And I can say I'm a proud owner of this painting. This is by Louverture Poisson. This is the ceremony that begins the revolution in 1791. This fellow is called Bookman. He's a Muslim slave. Ask yourself the question, what is a Muslim slave doing as a voodoo priest? What's the relationship between Muslims of Muslim religious practice and someone who becomes a voodoo priest and then who it ends up leading a revolution? This woman, we now know her name is Fatima. But no book writes about, everybody writes about, not no book, lots of books write about this fellow because he's in, he's in Haitian paintings from the 1800s. Nobody writes about this lady. But look at the picture and look where the painting and look where she's the center. Look, she's the one holding the knife. <coughs> The voodoo ceremony at Boyce Cowan is a ceremony in which they will kill an animal and they will then begin the, the insurrection. What then do we, can we make of this? I mean, the usual, you know, the artist will have, you know, thunder, you know, you have to have that and so on. But what, <laughs> what, what can you make of this? And particularly of her. And how can we then begin to think about of doing a history of the revolution that begins not with Bookman alone, but begins with Bookman and Fatima. And therefore, what kind of things can we begin to write? My third painting, Algio Carpenter's book, Kingdom of This World. Don't know if any of you know it. But in the Kingdom of This World, there's a fellow called Mackinda. This fellow is, comes before Bookman. And his fellow is one arm, was a slave, worked in the uh, machines, lost his arm, be began a, a, a strategy, or, a tap, or if you wish, a set of strategies that attempted to poison all the planters. They caught him, and they put him in the fire to burn him in the middle of Sandaman. They did not tie him down properly. And he jumps out of the flames. They catch him again and burn him. But this painting of Mackindal jumping out of the flames becomes an extremely important way in Haitian legends and in Haitian voodoo and in Haitian oral history to think about the meaning of the actual revolution itself. And when the revolution doesn't collapse, but when, the, when I argue when the revolutionary army becomes if you wish, oppressive and authoritarian. It is this figure that is invoked by ordinary people. What is my point, therefore? <clears throat> my point, therefore, is that to think through, begin to think through a set of archives, painting and voodoo and so on, then one begins to begin to think about a different way to tell the actual story of the revolution. To begin to grapple with the new beginning of the revolution, its ambiguities, its impossibilities, and to begin to perhaps, if you wish, tell a different story of the Haitian Revolution. Obviously, the Haitian Revolution is what I like to call a long revolution. It begins in 1791, 
and really culminates in 1804 with the Independence Declaration of Dessalines. <coughs> it is both <coughs> an anti-slavery revolution as well as a revolution for political independence. It is a ruptural event. It is an event in which a set of questions are raised, questions which are not raised necessarily in the American Revolution, and questions which are not necessarily raised in the French Revolution. If the American and the French Revolution raised <coughs> questions of obedience, raised questions of sovereignty, and raised questions of what natural liberty would look like in relationship to questions of representation and obedience, the Haitian Revolution raised the long Haitian Revolution raises the questions of what freedom might really look like. <coughs> it therefore allows us, if you wish, if you begin to tell the story different, to develop a different, a different genealogy of freedom. A different genealogy of freedom that is not about negative or positive freedom in the liberal frame. It also allows us to begin to develop, if you wish, a different conceptual history. A different history of political thought and of political philosophy about what freedom might look like and what practices, what are the relationship of practices to questions of thinking and thought. One, therefore, in which I would argue the questions of practices and the imagination becomes foreground. If it is accurate to say that we are in a strange time in the history of thought and in the history of political thought and philosophy, where sometimes we circle around ruins and failures, we might remember, need to remember that our engagement as human beings with time, which therefore makes it historical time, tells us that ruin and failure are all parts of our human condition. But so too are hope and possibilities. Thank you very much. <clears throat>
until we saw a painting of the son of Henry Christoph, who was one of the revolutionary leaders, painted in 1807 by a man called Richard Evans, an English artist. And what that led us to discover, we found it in Puerto Rico, what that, in the old house, right? What that led us to begin to understand was then said, oh, hold on, there's a lot of history here. It then, we then found out what? That Christoph, in, after the revolution, invited Richard Evans to come to Haiti to set up an art school in Port-au-Prince and in Cape Haitian. And, and that this art school began to work and produced a whole set of artists from the 1800s. So it may have been one of the first art schools in the Americas. What that means, therefore, is that there is a tradition. And within that tradition, you then want to think of one, one we, some of us began to think about what were the things that were being painted. So we began to scour and we began to find paintings in houses here, but particular paintings in Paris and, 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 and France, you know, the colonial relation. And there were paintings of portraitures, <clears throat> but there were also very interesting paintings. There were paintings of slaves and Native Americans in the 1800s, which then allows us to begin to understand how can, why Haiti became, was transformed from saint Domingue to Haiti, which was the indigenous name of the place, because there was a relationship between the two. What then happens is that in the 20th century, that many Haitian artists then draw from this tradition. And in drawing from this tradition, they then paint a whole set of, if you wish, images about Haitian history. So that this thing is by Winston Alacroft. The, this one here, Mackinda, jumps out to the fire. Painted in the 1960s. But he is drawing on a certain thing when you interview him that he learned from his grandmother. That's not in the history books. Do you, 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 see, what, you see what I'm saying, right? So that, that therefore then begins to say to us, okay, what are the questions of memory of people of it? How then does, how do people then begin to think about this particular figure? Why would his grandmother tell him about this figure, but not Toussaint? Or not Desiree? Right? Why does Mackendall then appear? And then you begin to read Algier Carpenter's book, and you, and you see that. <clears throat> um, Kingdom of this world. Written in 1940s, 49, if my memory serves me right. This, the painter, the, the, the one, the work before that, which is the one that, um, that I say I, 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 you know, is my favorite, uh, this one. This is, this fellow was working in the 1920s and 1930s. He's not trained. Right? Alicorn has some training. He's not trained. Uh, he's what they call naive, it's spelled N-A-I-V-E. We want to get rid of that kind of notion. And one, is he's arguing, he's, he says, I am not a spirit, I'm not a lord, but the laws have commanded me to write, to talk about the history of Haiti and to paint the history of Haiti by talking through the laws. But he says, I'm not one. So he spends time going around Haiti, rural villages and so on, picking up these stories and then painting these, these stories. My argument is that these then gives us, if you, as Andre Pierre, these then gives us an entrance, entrance into a certain business of myths and legends and memories and so on of people, how people remember the revolution for us to begin to try and think about the meaning of the revolution itself. So in other words, <clears throat> we know the dates of the revolution. We know what happened to the French, we know what happened to Toussaint, we know the date of independence and so on. But my argument is that there is another layer about the significance of the revolution that we need to untap and begin to understand. And what is interesting about what the, the, what the paint, what these artworks do does, is that they could, because they go into the 20th century, early 20th century, and certainly to the mid 20th century, that there is a way in which this business of the revolution and its, if you wish, echoes and reverberations becomes really very, very important. It also means how can you then begin to understand the politics of Haiti? I mean, I'll take it one step further. Why is it that um, 
that Aristide calls himself Toussaint all the while. And I puzzled over that for many, many months sir, until I began to understand the oral history and the memory that is in these paintings. Because, Aris, because Toussaint then has a, is, has a certain memory. And it's the memory that you are too close to the French. Not that we don't admire you, not that we don't respect you, but you were too close to the French. All right? And you have to ask yourself, okay, Aristide says I'm, when he comes back from the United States, that I'm too soft over child. Those of us who are outside would say, he's invoking the name of the revolutionary leader. Those persons inside Haiti would say, yeah, yeah, okay, we know where you're coming from. Right? Which then allows us again to begin to understand a set of complexities which may not, we may not see quite from the outside. In other words, one of the things I'm trying to get at is that to understand the complexities of both politics, of history, of ideas, and so on, requires us to pay very great attention in situations of colonized and racialized population groups, great attention to what I call some symbolic forms, and, counter, and, and therefore to counter symbolic forms. And we have not yet, in my view, um, developed, I mean, you know, there's Clifford Gertz and uh, anthropology. But those of us who are theorists have not yet developed the ways in which, and, you know, we talk about ethnographic workers, so we have not yet developed the ways in which we can begin to come to grips with this. Sorry for that long answer. <coughs> century decolonization when it did happen because you set up this uh, moment in the 30s when he's holding up Haitian revolution as I understand it as a kind of paradigmatic form for the um, anti-colonial struggle and yet from the perspective of today or even when he died he would have seen that most of the anti-colonial movements actually culminated not in revolutions that changed, transformed class structures, but really simply saw a handing over of power from a colonial to a national elite. How, how did he deal with that? Or, or how, did he recognize um, problems in, in the way that decolonization actually happened? Uh, in relationship to how he had presumably hoped it would happen? I mean, I don't like to say what I thought somebody would have said, right? um, but I mean, my own reading of CLR suggests the following. One, that he was very clear that certain kinds of decolonization would lead to the, situation, the situations that we now have today. That for him, unless you had a decolonization which included the vast majority of the people acting on their own, then we are going to end up in the stalemate and in the situation that we have ended up in. So if you read the, his, um, the, his, the, the, his, his text on, on Caribbean independence, for example, um, on, um, on uh, uh, his, news, his newspaper articles in We the People or in the Nation, or his text on uh, party politics in the Caribbean in 61, which is on the cost of uh, independence and which in Ghana is already independent and he has a travel to Ghana already, <laughs> then you will see that he is very preoccupied. In a way, Fanon would become preoccupied um, in Wretched of the Earth in the chapter on the national bourgeoisie, that he's very preoccupied that independence without mass transformation was going, was going to lead to a, a dead end. Uh, to a dead end. I think though that he had <coughs> he has he still he, he, he stood on one ground which he never, which he never relented on, which I think that we need to kind of think about. And his, his, the ground is that he says, I was born in a world of colonial empires. He was born in 1901. The sun never set on the British Empire in 1901. Three-fourths of the world population was in, under colonial thrall. He says that by the 1950s, 40s and 1950s, India, Ghana. That what happens is that the, the, 
colonial power, colonial empire begins to collapse. That the actual movement of a set of people, of three quarters of the world peoples, into a different social and political status, particular political status, he argues means the end of the old, end of the old world. And I think there is something there that we want to, that one wants to think about. Because from our perspective of the 21st century, colonialism seems like a kind of distant past that, you know, that don't have no significance. I was in Jamaica three weeks ago, just giving a keynote to my professor who was retired, who did supervise my dissertation. And I turned on the television news in Jamaica, in about 10 o'clock news. 60, they just did a survey, 60% of the Jamaican population wants to go back to colonialism. Six, zero. And I have to pause. Because, I mean, it's not on my horizon, I'm in the States, or I'm in Africa, or so on and so forth. But I have to pause. Because I have to ask myself, what are the set of conditions that lead to people saying this, who had no, because, because 40% of the Jamaican population is under 25. So what are the set of conditions that would lead people to this particular thing? A, it is a, is a total misunderstanding of what colonialism is about. Absolute lacuna that what colonialism was really about, economic, politically, and socially. But also, it is a desperation in trying to figure out how to manage and what kind of thing we need to do at this moment, in a historic moment when there seem to be no future possibilities. And if you don't think there's any future possibilities, then the only thing you can do is to go back to the old and hope that somehow the old might take care of some of the difficulties that one has. Right? My, th my, other, my response to you is that I also think we need, and I'm saying this to um, Lord and to another colleague, that I think that we need to do a history of, colon of decolonization. That's a little different from what we have. What history that says that we went up to Bangdong and after Bangdong everything collapsed and that was it in that story. What I think may be interesting is to think about the set of arguments, the set of discussions, the set of political ideas and political practices that a group of men and women in the 1920s and 30s and 40s were attempting to do by understanding their societies and developing radical politics and radical ideas about colonialism and the end of colonialism itself. And here I mean a specific set of <coughs> historic moments before many of these political parties, in my view, transform themselves from nationalist mass movements of some shape or form to kind of Soviet-led Marxism-Leninist political parties. Because you can actually trace a certain kind, if you are, if you want, a certain kind of way in which politics begins to operate at that specific moment of transformation. Not exact moment, but at that moment. <clears throat> and my discussions with many people on the African continent have led me to believe that that particular moment allowed people to begin to construct a set of politics in which the activity of ordinary people became secondary. Because they themselves knew what was best. And if you tie that to questions of development projects and major development projects on how to get money from the World Bank and so on and so forth, you can begin to see a particular direction. So it is not as if, okay, <coughs> that, okay, the, the anti-colonial project has failed. Of course it's happened. I mean, you know, yeah, I mean, if you think, if, if, you know, it didn't bring freedom. But my question is, okay, all right, that's easy. That's failed. My question is, okay, how? What are the, what were the elements of that project? How can we tease it out? Are there, are there <coughs> questions that were raised in that project? that might be useful for us to think about today, rather than to put a kind of closure over it and say, no, forget it, or, let's, or another way to say, let us forget it and go back to the past. I know. <coughs> well, thank you very much for this uh, presentation. I'm a Russian historian, and what you said really resonates with what I'm doing as a Russian scholar with uh, you know, anti-colonial thinkers from the 20s and 30s.
um, and their criticism of uh, colonialism and their theories of revolution. So my question, I have actually two questions. Um, one is about this framework of, of revolution that seems to be really important for your project. So uh, black Jacobins were developing their post-colonial criticism and their concept of revolution within this Western epistem, mm -hmm. right? So it's Michel, Michelet, it's uh, uh, Trotsky, Marx, so obviously this is Western epistem. Um, and um, what you are trying to do actually to recover kind of alternative uh, meaning of, of freedom and uh, revolution uh, and probably an alternative, different kind of engagement with historical time and with history, uh, composing this different archive, historical archive. So my question is, why do you need this uh, framework of revolution, which implies a particular engagement with history, a particular engagement with historical time, or linear time, and the idea of rupture, that you have to revise uh, and, and make more hybrid, but still this is a very kind of Western uh, mm -hmm. type of um, uh, historical concept. And my second question is, and you already started answering this question, is about the politics of future uh, today. Um, and I think that this is a kind of rather global question. This is not about only about the failure of a post-colonial project or the crisis of, of, of nationalism as an alternative to imperialism. But this is about the crisis of the politics of the future that we observe today, uh, everywhere in aesthetic projects, in, in philosophy, in the crisis of uh, science fiction, everywhere. Somehow I think, and this is what I kind of gathered from, from your response to the previous question, is somehow connected with the collapse of the, um, of the second world as an alternative uh, project of modernity. Second world, Second world as an sorry. alternative modernity project. So, but in general, if uh, if um, well, what I know better, the studies of post-Soviet post-coloniality, also based on oral history, on interviewing uh, intellectuals and ordinary people living now in this post-imperial post-Soviet world, what you have, you have the rejection of any subjectivity. Mm -hmm. People just don't claim any historical responsibility and any subjectivity. They are just victims of uh, totalitarianism, mm -hmm. of all kinds of imperialisms and colonialism. So I wonder whether you encounter this problem in your oral history project and how in general you can you know, just respond <coughs> to this problem of the crisis of the politics of the future. Okay, thank you very much. I mean, firstly, I would just I, put on, I would just say to you, um, I am not. Um, how should I put it? I'm not interested in revolution as a kind of linear time. I don't think in linear time terms. I mean, I describe the things in linear, but I think um, I'm interested. I'm, my training is in political philosophy, but I became very interested in trying to understand political philosophy from history. Right, um, trying to understand. Okay, how is it? The, what kind? How can we begin to understand history, <clears throat> and then begin to understand the political ideas that emerge at a specific moment? And I be, um, have a particular conception of history, not as linear time, but as as motion, and that and that sometimes in that motion things change, um, and it is that moment of change that I'm, that, I, that I'm, I'm, I focus on. Obviously, the Black Jacobins and so. On. But I'm interested in that moment of change <clears throat> because I think that moment of change is this rupture, is this event. But I th also think that this mo that moment of structure has both a simultaneous backward and forward glance, okay? And that it is never one or the other in the way that one thinks about it, but that there's always a a, a contestation uh, of, uh, in in it, and we can go through all sorts of things about it, um, from this formation of the Soviets to you know to whatever. To see this how this contestation actually um, uh, actually uh, occurs. <coughs> so my interest in is is about what Anna Maren calls new beginnings and way in which freedom and new beginnings coincide. That's my that's that, that's that's the interest. In other words, what particular new questions emerge at what specific moment, and what are the conditions for these questions to emerge? Sometimes they're answered, sometimes they're not answered. 
Sometimes it's framed as revolution, sometimes it's not framed as revolution. So, you know, I, 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 want to, want, I, I, want, I wanted to make that. I, I, unlike some people, I am not, I don't believe that we are in a moment where a revolution is like, you know, 500 years. I don't, I don't necessarily, I don't know. I, I don't even like the word so much because, you know, when you say revolution, people think, okay, you mean something, some kind of capital music thing that will happen tomorrow, something you know, like that. What I'm trying to think about is the thing through what, how do moments of transformation happen? And what, what kind of things happen in those specific moments? And understand it from history, and understand from a certain from a certain view of, of of politics, because there is a politics of thinking that revolution is off the agenda. Our transformation is off the agenda, and that politics is basically a politics that history has stalled, and that we are in ruin, and that all the next the, really the next best thing is liberalism, and that's all we can do and that there is no real possibility for any kind of fundamental change at all in the world. My argument is really goes back to a very simple one. If there was no fundamental change in the world, I couldn't be standing up here speaking. I would be in chains on a plantation. And that therefore, if there's a way in which <coughs> that, that the ways in which the world, history of motion has meant that there has been some change, has there been I don't think there's a kind of final kind of emancipation or change, which is what I think a lot of people think about revolution do. They, in other words, revolution then ushers in the, the, the milk and honey and heaven. I don't think so. I think it puts questions on the agenda. It, it is it's about ordinary people, imperfect as we all are as human beings, trying to make something, trying to make the place a much more better, a better place for us to, to live in. Whether we succeed or not, <coughs> obviously to me, you know, is 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 the question. But I don't think that there is a moment in history in which we can say that human beings have not made an attempt to change the condition in which they lived in. Not in twenty years, thirty years, but yes, in four hundred years, in hundred years, in fifty years. Or whatever. The politics of the future. I. <coughs> I find it difficult to think about the politics of the future because I don't know what it may look like. I think any politics of the future has to have certain elements and those elements has to be the following. One, that it has to think very hard about what freedom can look like. Very, very hard. What the practices of freedom are about, historically what all political philosophers have talked about and so on about questions of freedom, in my view, but at the same time to think through this question of freedom from those who have been slaves or enslaved. What is precisely are they talking about? What are the set of things that we may want to think about? It therefore means for me that one of the things that one has to do is to think that freedom is not an end in itself. That freedom, there is no, is not a kind of telos, and then that's how we kind of fold our hands. That freedom is about a set of practices in which I argue there is always a constant shifting target, and that constant shifting target has to do with what are the specific set of human experiences we have at a, any specific moment that we want to deal with, <coughs> and therefore there is no, in my view, one kind of overarching thing as that this is freedom. There is much more a set of practices about freedom that we might want to think of. So the first thing to me is to think about questions of freedom. The second thing to, for me to think about if you want to think about the politics of the future is to recognize that politics is not an end in itself either. That we have taken from Aristotle the notion that man is a political animal. I want to argue that man is not a political animal. That man is essentially, man, you know, meaning using Aristotle, but men, that human beings are just, are primarily social animals. And that it is in that sociality that we have to, because we are thrown together, use Heidegger's phrase of being thrownness, 
that we've thrown together, that we then have to construct, if you wish, a certain kind of politics. And those politics I want to call common, a certain kind of common association. It is not, therefore, that politics then becomes the highest thing, the highest good. It is that the work to create the common association becomes the good, but also, very importantly, that politics becomes the means to the creation of this. All of that means, in my view, a kind of, and the third thing is where really it draws from the French thinker, and I admit this, Jacques Rancière, and the notion of the question of strong equality. What does a form of strong equality mean? And I think if you, for me, those are the three, set of three things that one wants to think about. Freedom, questions of politics not as an end in itself, but as a but as something towards an end that constructs a good, and a question in the business of strong equality. After that, I don't know. <laughs> right? and, and God God knows, then that's fine. I don't. Right? <laughs> and I just think that <clears throat> I think that that those of us who are thinking about what the future might look like has to st have to start from that. I have to start from trying to theorize and think about that. And history becomes important as a kind of engagement to time because in my view one has to go back and begin to think through what, what were the attempts that attempted to do this. They failed, but that failure is part of the human condition. I just don't get it. I don't get it when people say we failed. Because I don't know that human condition is full of success. Okay. So one more. <coughs> so can I I'll ask? Yeah. yeah. So just actually, this goes along with um, exactly the kind of potential or, or uh, even impossibility to kind of imagine a politics of the future. And so one of the things, one of the practices that you mentioned uh, in your talk uh, is is play. And I guess I want you to say just a little bit more about maybe because because of the phrase that you've repeated to us today that I've kind of that I recognize is the conditions of possibility. <laughs> and so what are the conditions? What do you think? How do you think about the conditions of possibility of play today in thinking about revolution or how to write revolution? I think to think about the conditions of possibility requires us to do something else, which I didn't talk about to that today, which is the work of the imagination. Mm -hmm. And well, I think that one of the real problems in thinking through politics um, and political thought and so on is the request of the imagination. Mm -hmm. And that's because Hobbes told us that the imagination was problematic. And from he said that, and those of us who are doing political theory kind of banish the imagination. Right? Uh, but that there is a, but you can't think about the questions in my view of play of politics, of what a politics, what our alternative politics look like, unless you begin to think about, unless you allow the work of the imagination to do that. And that to me becomes really very important, because I've argued elsewhere that one of the key things about our political moment is war, drones, poverty, unemployment, debt crisis, all those things. But one of the key things which you don't pay attention is that imperial power today, and particularly American imperial power, operates on a terrain in which its objective is actually to shut down play and imagination. And to actually say that what we have is it. History has stalled, forget it. And that becomes very important because if the, or if the order is then constructed in its, both in its fantasy and its desire, that there is no possibility and there's nothing that can will happen. We should all just pack up and have a good time. And <clears throat> therefore, for me, and this is the next stage of trying to think through some of the work, is what is the role of the imagination in this? Which is one of the reasons I'm fascinated by art, because the art then allows for that play as well. And particular Haitian art in a set of contexts where, quite frankly, there is 90%, sorry, there's a vast, enormous illiteracy. And so art then becomes that terrain in which the imagination works, right? For people to think through different possibilities. Does that make sense to you? Mm -hmm. and, and you can see it if you <coughs> go online, uh, there's an artist called Edward Duval Carey, and look at his five pieces on called Memories of History, huge five panels, in which he attempts to do some of what I'm trying to talk about. And so what I'm talking about doesn't just come out of my head and my study and reading. It is both that and talking to artists and working with them. 
Thank you all very, very much. <laughs>